Hello everyone. Welcome back to the second lecture on the course on human behavior. In the last lecture, which was the first lecture, and what we did was we spent some time in understanding what is psychology. Now, since human behavior itself encompasses the study of psychology, so this course can actually be considered as an introductory course in psychology. So, what you are going to do here in this course is understand human behavior, why do humans do certain things and how do they do it and is there any prediction or not. So now let's do a quick recap of first class. As I discussed in the last class, what happens is that element prediction is very easy for natural objects and natural things. There are certain laws and theorems and these laws and theorems are followed by natural elements. So if you take physics, if you take any other sciences, the prediction of behavior or the prediction of any element for that matter is very easy. But when it comes to studying humans, when it comes to studying us as people, it is very difficult. The study of human behavior encompasses the science of psychology. Another thing that I said in the last class is that why is the study of psychology difficult? The one reason being that the person who is studying and the person who is being studied are both humans. And so understanding human behavior is a difficult thing because human beings are studying human beings. So if an element is studying itself, it becomes a difficult task. The second point is that human behavior is unpredictable. They act or behave in unpredictable ways. It is extremely difficult to predict these unpredictable behaviors. Now the core principle in the study of psychology or human behavior is that individual differences exist. So what is the meaning of the individual differences? It means that every individual differs from other individual and that is why we are all different and so it becomes an interesting science where somebody who is being studied and somebody who is studying it are both of the same genre both are the same species and that is why psychology becomes a very interesting science so as compared to other sciences which are more accurate sciences psychology is a more probabilistic science Let's put it this way, we all have that one friend who is always running late. Well, based on their past behavior, we can assume that they will probably be late to our next hangout too. But we cannot say for sure because things can always change. That's basically what I mean by probabilistic signs. We can make predictions about a person's behavior based on their past actions and certain assumptions, but we cannot be sure of what they will do in a specific situation. So the science of psychology is probabilistic. And this probability varies with the kind of knowledge that you have about human behavior. So the more knowledge you have about human behavior, the better your explanations the better your predictions and the better the chance of understanding why human beings do or why people do what they do. So that is the core idea of this course. So let's recap what we did in the first lecture. Now in the first lecture what we did was we looked at what is psychology, the definition of it and then we looked at how is this definition broken into and what all comprises the science of psychology. And we quickly went into understanding the meaning of psychology, what is psychology and its scope also things like what psychologists do, how they disagree and so on and so forth. That is what we did in the first lecture. Also we looked at the historical origin of psychology which is where did it start from and as I said in the last lecture it starts from ancient Greece. Psychology starts with philosophy and so there are two branches of psychology one is philosophy and the other one is physiology and 
two branches are combined to produce psychology. And then we looked at the primary questions on which psychologist agree or disagree at which point. Also, we discussed about the age-old debate which is nature versus nurture. And another one is psychology is a scientific science. And after that, what we discussed in the first lecture was the various fields of psychology. Also studied the schools of psychology. There are two primitive schools which are structuralism and functionalism and then the three original schools of psychology which are behaviorism, gestaltism and psychoanalysis. So these schools, these five schools were there since the 1940s and after the second world war newer instruments came in and promised a better development of psychology. And so we discussed in the last class the modern schools of psychology which were information processing model which basically is called the computer model and this is the core model upon which psychology was reformulated or the theories of psychology were reformulated. Then the study of human language or psycholinguistics which will actually tell how human beings produce language. Then comes the study of neuropsychology. Everything that happens in human behavior now is a result of our brain. Neuropsychology is the study of how the brain influences our actions and thought process. And so if you want to study the mind, you have to study the brain. And that is why the schools of neuropsychology came in which actually studies the relationship between certain neurological events and mental processes. So this is a quick recap of what we have studied in the last lecture. In today's lecture we are going to study how different perspectives in psychology can shape our approach to looking at different behaviors and researching different psychological issues. We will also look at the methods which psychologists use in their research. So let's quickly start this lecture. Now there are different perspectives in psychology. There are five perspectives in psychology that should be named the biological perspective, the behavioral perspective, then the cognitive perspective, the psychoanalytic perspective and lastly the subjective perspective. Let's study what these perspectives are all about. First of all, we should know what is a perspective and a perspective is a way of thinking, a way of analyzing a problem. So let's take a model behavior and try to see what these perspectives are. Let's say there is an event, a boy gets angry and hits someone. Now this act of hitting someone which is a behavior and this act of getting angry which is a psychological state, the act of hitting someone by getting angry, this behavior can be explained by psychological perspectives. So what we are going to do in this situation or what I am going to do is I will tell you different perspectives through which this behavior can be explained. The first perspective is called the biological perspective. So what is the biological perspective? The biological perspective says that it seeks to understand the relationship between behavior and neurological processes. So what this perspective actually wants to do or what actually it does is that it looks at why our behavior happens in terms of neurological functions. What does the meaning of this? It means that any kind of behavior a person shows as a result of stimulus because stimulus causes the behavior. So if we want to understand why people behave in certain ways on a biological level and if we want to study what is happening inside the brain then we have to study which neurons are being activated and which neurometers are involved and which part of the brain are working together to interpret a stimulus and give commands to act in a certain way and this is called the biological perspective. The biological perspective is all about understanding how behavior is related to the workings of the brain and nervous system. It examines factors such as neurological processes, brain processes or neurons and neurotransmitters to 
explain why people behave the way they do. Then the behavioral perspective. On the other hand, the behavioral perspective states that behavior is largely shaped by past experiences and rewards. It suggests that people's actions are a result of learning and conditioning. This means that we often do certain things because we have been rewarded for doing them in the past. And our behavior becomes conditioned to seek out those rewards over time. We learn to repeat behaviors that brings us happiness and success while avoiding those that causes us discomfort or failure. So why do people do certain behaviors? People do certain behavior in certain situations because they have the past because doing that behavior gave the person some reward and when something works out positively they learn that behavior and repeating the same behavior again and again now the relationship between biological and behavioral perspective the biological perspective is all about understanding how our brain and body work together to influence our behavior for example, if a person has a genetic predisposition for a certain disorder, it can affect their behavior. Similarly, hormones like cortisol play a role in stress and anxiety, which can influence behavior. The behavioral perspective on the other hand is all about how our environment and experiences shape our behavior. For example, if a child is consistently rewarded for cleaning their room, they will be more likely to do it again in the future. Or if someone is punished for stealing, they will be less likely to do that behavior again in the future. It's like looking at the why behind someone's actions from two different angles. One from the inside out and one from the outside in. The behavioral perspective suggests that behavior is primarily shaped by past rewards and conditioning. People repeat actions that have been rewarded and avoid those that have been punished. Then the cognitive perspective. Then you have the cognitive perspective and what is cognitive perspective? The cognitive perspective in the other hand looks at how mental processes such as perception, memory, uh, reasoning, decision making and problem solving influence behavior. It examines the cognitive processes that under such as how we perceive, how we think and remember things. The cognitive perspective explains behavior by looking at how a person thinks and processes information. For example, imagine you are in a store and you see a dress that you like. Then you perceive it and you remember your budget. Also you think if it's worth the price and you decide whether to buy it or not. All these mental processes, perception, then uh, memory, reasoning and decision making influence your behavior in that situation. It's like understanding behavior as a result of how we process information and make choices based on that. It's a more holistic approach looking at the whole thought process behind an action rather than just focusing on past rewards and conditioning. So the cognitive perspective explains behavior. The mental processes that underlie it such as perception, memory, uh, reasoning and decision making. For example, let's say a person is deciding whether to take an umbrella before going out in the rain or not. He perceives the weather, also he checks his memory of past rainy days and he thinks about the likelihood of getting wet and then he makes a decision based on all this information. So all these mental processes influence the behavior of taking an umbrella or not. It's like understanding why a person does a certain act by looking at the thought processes and information processing system that leads to that behavior. All of these mental processes, perception and uh, memory, reasoning and decision making influence your behavior and leads you to make that decision on what to do. It's a way of understanding why people make certain choices and behave in certain ways 
by looking at the thought processes and information processing system that goes on in their mind. Then the psychoanalytic perspective. Now the fourth perspective is called the psychoanalytic perspective. And this perspective says that most behavior occur because of unconscious process including desires, fear and belief. And this perspective believes that any behavior a person does or any act a person does is because there are certain unconscious processes. There are certain fears a person has or certain anxiety a person has or say certain desires a person has and these desires and anxieties which are hidden in the depth of the unconsciousness which he has not aware of and which is in an unconscious level makes him to do something. For example, let's say a person is afraid of speaking in public, but he has a desire to become a successful politician. He might not be aware of the fact that this fear is rooted in his childhood experiences, but it's still influencing his behavior and choices. He might avoid public speaking opportunities or try to overcome this fear by taking public speaking classes. This perspective argues that this fear is an unconscious process that the person is not aware of but it's still influencing their behavior. It's like understanding behavior by looking at the unconscious motivations, desires and fears that drive our actions even if we are not aware of them. Then lastly the subjective perspective. There is another perspective which is called subjective perspective. So what is subjective perspective? The subjective perspective is all about understanding behavior in relation to people's personal experiences and how they construct the world around them. It's more of a social perspective which suggests that behavior is shaped by the acceptance of the society around us. The subjective perspective looks at how people's behavior is influenced by their personal experiences and how they view the world around them. It suggests that people's actions are shaped by what is considered uh, socially acceptable to the people around them. It's like understanding behavior by looking at how people want to be seen by society and how society rewards or punishes certain actions. Okay, so let's say someone is very fashion conscious and they always wear trendy clothes because it's considered more socially acceptable in their social circle. They might not have any personal interest in fashion but they have learned through their social interactions that looking fashionable is more socially acceptable and it's also a way of showing their identity and belonging to that group. This perspective suggests that behavior is influenced by the way society rewards or punishes certain actions and the subjective experiences of the individual. So now, as I said before, I will take up a behavior and try to explain that behavior using all of these perspectives. So let's take the example of somebody who gets angry and when he gets angry, he hits someone. For example, he hits another boy. Now why does this person hit when he is angry? This perspective suggests that the boy's behavior of hitting someone when he gets angry can be understood by looking at it from different perspective. First, the biological perspective. Let's take the biological perspective first. The biological perspective on anger suggests that our brain plays a role in how we feel when we are angry. Certain areas of the brain and chemicals called neurotransmitters are involved in the feeling of anger. When these chemicals are activated and sent to the certain parts of the brain, it can make a person feel angry and potentially leads to physical actions such as hitting. In simple terms, the biological perspective says that there is a physical reason for why we feel angry and it can cause us to act in a certain ways. Now using the behavior perspective to that behavior. This hitting someone else can be explained in a very easy way. The behavior perspective explains that a person may hit someone else because they have learned that it results a positive outcome. 
For example, if the person has hit someone in the past and the other person ran away or did not confront them, the person may have learned that hitting is a good way to make others go away. This is why the person continues to hit others when they are angry, because they have been rewarded for it in the past. In simple terms, the person learned that hitting is an effective way to handle their anger because it gets the desired outcome of other person leaving or backing off. This is called the behavioral perspective. After that, the cognitive perspective. Now using the cognitive perspective to understand that behavior. So this boy gets angry and hits someone. So what makes him hit someone? Now cognitive perspective says that when a person gets angry and hits someone, it's because of the thoughts and decision making process that happens in their mind. According to this perspective, when the boy hears something that he finds insulting or taboo, it triggers anger in him. As he starts thinking about it, his mind goes through all the different ways he could respond to this anger. He may have learned from past experiences that hitting back is an effective way to deal with his anger. So his decision making process chooses hitting as the best behavior to express his anger. In simpler terms, the cognitive perspective suggests that the person's thought and past experiences play a role in the decision to hit someone when they are angry. Now the psychoanalytic perspective. So what is the psychoanalytic perspective? According to the psychoanalytic perspective, when a person gets someone, it may be due to the unconscious fears and desires that they have. This perspective suggests that people have a creature instinct and when a person gets angry, they may have hidden motives and desires that drive them to hit back. These unconscious fears and desires may make the person feel that they need to hit back before they hit themselves. In simpler terms, the psychoanalytic perspective suggests that people's unconscious fears and desires play a role in their decision to hit someone when they are angry. Then lastly, the subjective perspective. So what is the subjective perspective? Why somebody gets angry and hits back? The subjective perspective says that a person's behavior of hitting someone when they are angry may be influenced by societal expectations and the environment around them. For example, if a boy gets angry and hits someone, it may be because he has learned from the people around him and his past experience that this is an acceptable way to react in such situation. In simpler terms, the subjective perspective suggests that a person's decision to hit someone when they are angry may be influenced by the expectations and beliefs of the people and the society around them. So the same behavior of getting angry and hitting back can be explained by five different perspectives or five different viewpoints. Now the relationship between psychological and biological perspective. So what is the relationship between the psychological and biological perspective? The psychological perspective and the biological perspectives are closely related and often overlap in their approach to understanding human behavior and mental processes. The biological perspective, which is rooted in the field of biology, focuses on breaking down complex systems and processes into simpler parts to better understand them. This approach is known as reductionism. So what is reductionism? Reductionism is a way of understanding complex things by breaking them down into smaller, simpler parts. It is also the study of the relationship between brain function and behavior instead of just focusing on the behavior alone. So what we are doing here is that the explanation of psychology, the explanation of hitting back, the behavior is broken down in terms of neurons and brains and certain brain regions and that is what is called the reductionism. 
for example, if someone gets angry and hits back, the biological perspective would explain this behavior by looking at the specific regions of the brain and neurotransmitters involved in the experience and expression of anger. This is reductionism because it simplifies the complex behavior of hitting back to the underlying biological processes happening in the brain. By combining both perspectives, we can get a more comprehensive understanding of the hitting back when someone becomes angry. One difference between the psychological and biological perspective is that the biological perspective focuses on the brain and biological factors related to behavior. For example, when studying anger, the biological perspective would look at the specific regions of the brain and neurotransmitters involved, while the psychological perspective would look at the thoughts, feelings and behaviors associated with the anger. One reason for this difference is that the biological perspective tends to simplify complex phenomena such as anger and uh, biological perspective tends to simplify complex things by breaking them down into smaller parts. This can be helpful in understanding how the brain works. Also, it can make the behavior seems less complex than it actually is. The biological perspective aims to simplify complex behaviors by focusing on the core brain processes. Additionally, psychological concepts and principles can be directly linked to the biological results and it creates an interactive relationship between the two perspectives. This means that some psychological experience and behaviors can be explained using biological principles for making it more easier to understand. The biological perspective looks at the brain and biological factors to understand behavior but it does not consider the impact of the past experience or the environment. This means that it may not always give a complete understanding of why a person behaves a certain way even though the same brain regions and neurotransmitters may be involved. The psychological perspective which takes into account past experiences and the current environment is needed to fully understand why a person behaves a certain way even if the same biological state is present. So, the biological perspective alone is not sufficient to understand behavior, the psychological perspective is needed too. Now the modern perspective. So newer perspectives have also come up with the start of the new century, the 20th century. And these newer perspectives are actually another way to look at psychological factors. Now cognitive neuroscience perspective. The current psychological perspective is called the cognitive neuroscience perspective. And what is the cognitive? It focuses on understanding cognitive processes using new techniques includes uh, neuroimaging and brain scanning. This perspective actually looks at how the brain processes and why people behave a certain way. And with the arrival of new technologies such as MRI, fMRI, PET scans and optical imaging, this perspective is able to study the brain in more detail and understand how it relates to behavior. Now the cognitive neuroscience perspective uses techniques like neuroimaging and brain scanning to study the brain as it performs certain actions. And so, it can actually look at what is actually going on in the brain, which area of the brains are responsible for certain kind of behavior. For example, the medial temporal lobe is a region of the brain that has been linked to the certain behaviors. The medial temporal lobe of the brain are responsible for memory. When studying memory, using neuroimaging techniques like fMRI or EEG, researchers can see that the medial temporal lobe, the C region that is the central regions C3 and C4 are more active when someone is remembering something. When certain parts of the brain show activity, it can indicate what a person is doing. If the temporal or parietal regions are active, it means the person is remembering something and if the frontal regions are active it means the person is doing tasks that involve planning and making decisions 
दिस टास्क आर टिपिकली एसोसिएटेड उथ द फ्रंट अफ द ब्रेन सो निउ टेक्निक्स एलाउ आज टू स्टाडी बिहेवियर इन टर्म्स अफ स्पेसिफिक रिजियन्स अफ द ब्रेन साच इज द टेम्पोराल एंड पैराइटल रिजियन्स इट हेल्प आज अंडारस्टेन्ड हाउ डिफरेन्ट पार्टस अफ द ब्रेन वार्क टूगेदार फर डिफरेन्ट बिहेवियर्स लाइक फर एक्जाम्पल सैंटिस्ट कैन नाउ टेल इफ सामवान इज रिमेम्बारिंग सामथिंग और जस्ट मेकिंग ए डिसन बै लुकिंग एट एक्टिविटी इन साउट इन ब्रेन रिजियन्स लाइक द टेम्पोराल एंड पैराइटल एरियाज दिस एलाउ आज टू हेव ए मोर कमप्लीट अंडारस्टेडिंग अफ बिहेवियार्स कम्पेयर टू द पास्ट बिहेवियरिस्ट एप्रोच हुईज ऑनलि फोकासड अन अबजार्विंग एक्शनस एंड नट द अंडारलाइंग ब्रेन एक्टिविटी now the evolutionary psychology perspective there is another new perspective which is called the evolutionary psychology perspective and now what does this perspective do so evolutionary perspective is a way of studying the biology behind human behavior it also takes into account the ideas and the concepts from anthropology and psychiatry This approach is called evolutionary psychology and it's a new way of looking at how and why we behave the way we do. It explains our behavior based on how it has evolved over time. What does this perspective do? It's a unique perspective that takes into account not just biology but also aspects of anthropology and psychiatry. so it's a combination of all three fields that help us understand why we behave the way we do for example why do humans walk away when they sense a situation to be fearful but they cannot fight let me give you an example why do humans tend to avoid a situation or walk away when they sense fear but cannot fight this behavior is rooted in our evolutionary past These are all that can help us understand the evolutionary psychology. It looks at the biological and evolutionary reasons behind human behavior to understand why we do certain things in a certain way. The idea behind evolutionary psychology is to study how behavior has evolved over time. Now, cultural psychology. Then there is something called cultural psychology. Cultural psychology focuses on how culture shapes our mental representation and understanding of psychological process. The cultural psychology is interested in studying how different cultures react to certain situations or behaviors. For example, nodding can mean different things in different cultures. In western cultures, nodding up and down typically means yes. while shaking the head side to side typically means no however in some asian cultures nodding up and down can also mean no and shaking the head side to side can mean yes so cultural psychology how cultural influences have shaped certain behaviors so an example of cultural psychology is the way people interact with the food and drink in different cultures So another example cultural psychology is the way how people interact with the food and drink in different cultures for example in some cultures drinking tea or walking with food is considered to be perfectly fine while in other cultures it would be considered rude and impolite for instance in the west people may drink tea while walking but in the east people may find it impolite to eat or drink while walking on the street this illustrate that how different cultures can have different attitudes towards the same behavior and how it shapes the way we act and interact and so understanding why these cultures differ is the viewpoint or subject matter of cultural psychology after that there is positive psychology so what is positive psychology positive psychology is the study of what makes people happy and successful it looks at how human beings strive to become successful positive psychology is the study of what makes people happy and fulfilled it examines how people can improve their well-being and reach their full potential The field uses scientific methods to understand how people develop self-worth and self-esteem and how they can become the best version of themselves. 
It also focuses on the positive aspects of the human life and behavior. So it looks at the positive side of humans and that is the basic core of studying positive psychology. Psychology is the study of human behavior and mental processes and all these perspectives aim to understand human behavior and mental processes in order to help people improve their existence. Now psychological research. So now we get into understanding how psychological research is done. So how do you conduct research in psychology if behavior is difficult to study? If behavior is such a hypothetical process that it varies from person to person, situation to situation or say event to event or time to time, how do you study human behavior? And that is what I will explain in this lecture. So there are various approaches to studying human behavior. So the first step in studying any human behavior is to develop a hypothesis. You should understand how to conduct research. So the first step in conducting any research whether in human behavior or any other field is to identify a genuine problem. So you must identify a problem. The first step is to identifying a problem and the second step is to generate a hypothesis. For example, imagine we have a problem that we want to study like whether drinking a hot beverage before an exam can improve performance. This is the problem we want to investigate. To study this, we need to come up with a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a possible explanation or prediction about what we think will happen. So in this case, we might predict that drinking a hot beverage before an exam will improve performance. This is just a guess based on the past experience and knowledge. We will then conduct research to test this hypothesis and see if it holds true or not. So the first step is to identifying a problem. And in this case, the problem is whether drinking hot beverage will improve academic performance or not. The second step is to come up with a hypothesis that drinking hot beverage before an exam will improve performance. So that is our hypothesis. Once we have our hypothesis, we need to test it to see if it's true or not. One way to do this is through an experiment. In an experiment, we set up a control group and a test group. The control group is a group that does not drink the hot beverage before the exam and the test group is the group that does. We then compare the performance of the two groups on the exam. We are trying to prove that drinking hot beverage before the exam improves performance. This is our alternate hypothesis. And the opposite of it is the null hypothesis which states that drinking hot beverage have no effect on performance. So we will be testing the by trying to prove that it's true and negating the null hypothesis that it has no effect on performance. When we want to do research, the first step is to come up with a hypothesis which is a statement that can be tested. In this case, our hypothesis is that drinking hot beverages before an exam will improve performance. But how did we come up with this idea? We looked at the previous research and studies to see what they say about this topic. We found that drinking hot beverages can increase arousal levels and when you are more alert and focused, you tend to perform better on an exam. So we decided to test this idea by conducting an experiment. So we picked three different hot beverages. One is tea, then coffee and another one is hot chocolate. These ingredients like tannin in tea, then caffeine in coffee and chocolate in the hot chocolate which are known to increase arousal levels. We want to see if these ingredients affect performance on an exam. The overall goal is to see if drinking hot beverages before an exam improves performance or not. So as I mentioned, we got our idea for this study from previous research which says that ingredients in hot beverages like tannin in tea and caffeine in coffee can increase arousal levels and improve performance. 
but there are other theories out there that disagree with this idea. Some theories say that tannin is better than caffeine, while others say that neither tannin nor caffeine lead to any arousal effects and hot beverages don't affect performance at all. But the idea behind our research is that when you are more alert and active, you will be able to perform better. So we are testing these competing theories by conducting our experiment to see which one is true. So the study is using a scientific method known as experimentation to examine the relationship between hot drinks which are coffee, tea or hot chocolate and academic performance. The research is unbiased and reliable meaning that it does not show any preference towards any of the hot beverages and the results will be consistent if the study is repeated. The goal is to determine which of the hot drinks has the greatest impact on performance. The independent variable being manipulated is the type of hot drink and the dependent variable being measured is academic performance. To control other factors that may influence performance, a random group of individuals from a certain class is selected and divided into two groups and one group consuming one of the hot drinks before an exam and the other group consuming only hot water. This allows for a comparison to be made between the effect of the hot drinks and the plain hot water. Scientists are doing an experiment to see if drinking different hot drinks before an exam can affect a student's test scores. They have four groups of students, 10 in each group. One group drinks tea, then one group drinks coffee, one group drinks hot chocolate and the last group only drinks water. They also have a group that does not drink anything called the control group. Why do we have a control group? This helps them understand or helps them to compare the result. The scientists want to see who drink these drinks, which is called the effect. The drink is the thing that changes in the experiment. It is called the independent variable and the effect is the dependent variable. This way they can compare the test scores of each group and see if any of the hot drinks helped the students do better on their exam. The test scores are the dependent variable because they are affected by the drink the students had before the exam. The type of drink is the independent variable and it is the only thing being changed in the experiment. Since all the students are equally intelligent and have taken from the same class, so the experiment is done under controlled conditions. After the exam, the scientist will look at the average test scores of each group and decide if any of the hot drinks helped the students perform better than the others or if they all just look at the average values that they have. Then we can actually tell whether coffee is more productive or drinking tea is more productive or hot chocolate is more productive or simply hot water is more productive and so on and so forth. So this way we can either verify the hypothesis and either accept the hypothesis or reject the hypothesis. If all the hot drinks produce good effect in comparison to water, we can say that the hot drinks are making the performance better. Now another thing, within the hot drinks, which one is more productive? Hot drink, coffee or hot chocolate? But what will happen if within the hot drinks, if they find that coffee is much better than tea and chocolate, then we can say that Coffee obviously is a better type of hot drink to take before an exam because it increases performance in certain way. And this is the easiest explanation that you can have about what is experimentation and how an experimentation is done. In this experiment, the independent variable is the type of hot drink consumed and the dependent variable is the academic performance of the students after consuming the drink. So how do you do the experiment? To conduct experiment, we use an experimental group where the variable being tested in this case which is the hot drink is present and a control group where the variable is not present in this case the group that only drinks water and in this experiment the group that was given hot coffee, tea and hot chocolate is the experimental group. 
and the group that only drank water is the control group. So to make sure that the experiment is fair and accurate, scientists randomly choose students from a group and put them into different groups of experiment. This is called random assignment. So that this is called random assignment. So that each group is equalized in terms of the number of people that it has. One thing is the monitoring system for assigning numbers to variables and how do we evaluate that? In this experiment, the way scientists measure the result is by looking at the student's test scores. Since test scores are numbers, it is easy to measure and compare the results of each group. Sometimes scientists do experiments where they cannot use numbers to measure the result. For example, if they ask you to rate how much you like a drink on a scale of 1 to 5, there is no actual measurement. In this case, scientists create a proxy measurement scale where they assign numbers to different responses. For example, 1 may mean you don't like the drink at all and 5 may mean you love it. This is important because at the end of the experiment, scientists want numbers to tell them what happened. And finally, the last thing is statistics. Statistics is basically a way of actually finding out what is different or how to compare results across different groups. So it's a mathematical discipline that enables summarizing and interpreting results. For example, in our case, when we found out the scores of different people from the coffee group, then from the tea group, chocolate group, and finally from the water group, what we did was we did a simple statistical analysis. Also, we could do a special test or just compare the average scores of each group. Now, mean is a statistical tool and this tool helps us understand the results of an experiment. To calculate mean, what we do is, we looked at the number of the scores of all the 10 people and add them up and then divide it by the total number of people. Let's say in the coffee group, if the scores are 56, 58, 64, 56 and so on, we add them all up and divide by the number of the people in that group, which is 10 in this case. Let's say hypothetically, in the coffee group, if the total score is 300 and there are 10 people in the group and we divide 300 by 10 and get an average score which is 30. Now this simple way of taking the total score and dividing this total score by the number of people is what we called the mean or the average. And this is a statistical technique that helps us compare the results of different groups. So, statistics is required for experimentation. Now, correlational method. Another way of doing psychological research is using the correlational method. What is the correlational method? A correlation method is used for situation when experiments are not feasible. It helps us understand the relationship between two variables. Let's say we have two variables, one variable is A and another variable is B. And we don't know whether A is causing B or B is causing A. But then there is a relation. What is the relation? If A increases or decreases, B also increases and decreases. It means correlation is when A and B change together. For example, if we observe that thunder and lightning happen at the same time, we can say that there is a correlation between them. But it's not clear whether thunder causes the lightning or lightning causes the thunder. Correlational research is when we see a relationship between two things but we don't know what causes what. For example, if every time you go to a supermarket, you lose money. We can see that there is a relationship between going to a money but we cannot say for sure whether going to supermarket causes you to lose money or if something else is causing both of these events to happen another example is if every time you touch something a sound occurs we can see that 
there is a relationship between touching something and hearing a sound but we don't know which one is causing the other for example happiness leads to good mood now we don't know whether happiness leads to good mood or good mood leads to happiness because happiness and good mood both variables are equally correlated we can see that as happiness increases mood also improves and as happiness decreases mood also get worsen but we cannot say for sure which one is the cause and which one is the effect this is when correlation method is used in such kind of experimentation in short correlation method is used to measure the relationship between two variables correlation is like a way to see how two things are related to each other like thunder and lightning if thunder happens a lot when lightning happens they have a strong relationship we use something called a correlation coefficient which is like a number that tells us how strong the relationship is the number is usually between minus 1 and 1 if the number is close to 1 that means the relationship is very strong and if the number is close to 0 that means the relationship is not very strong like if every time there is a thunder there is only half as much lightning the correlation between them is said to be 0.5 and 0.5 is a weak correlation so the relationship is not very strong if every time there is thunder there is also lightning and they happen at the same time it's called positive correlation if it's close to 1 it means they have a strong correlation if it is close to 0 it means they have a weak correlation but sometimes when one thing increases the other thing decreases like if every time there is more thunder there is less lightning we call this a negative correlation and just like positive correlation the number that tells us how strong the negative correlation is between minus 1 to 0 a stronger correlation is closer to minus 1 and a weaker correlation is closer to 0 if they increase and decreases in the same amount this is called perfect correlation if you beat someone he will stop crying this is a negative correlation now if you beat someone he increases in crying this is a positive correlation so you have to understand correlation in this way and if there is no connection at all between the two things it says the correlation method is used to determine the relationship between two variables in this case the error in face recognition and the brain damage in critical regions it can be observed that there could be a positive negative or no correlation at all between brain damage and facial recognition in some cases there is a negative correlation between the brain damage and facial recognition it means that the more damage the less recognition in other cases there is a positive correlation between the brain damage and facial recognition which means that the more damage the more recognition and also in some cases there is no relationship between the brain damage and facial recognition so sometimes we see two things happening together like thunder and lightning we can see that they happen at the same time but we don't know which one makes the other happen to figure this out we need to do a special experiment where we change one thing and see what happens to the other but sometimes it's not easy to do these experiments so in some cases we cannot say for sure which one causes the other we can only say that they happen together like if we look at hot drinks and how well someone does on a test we cannot say for sure that the drink causes the change in performance it's just hard to tell with some things it may be challenging to understand but it is possible for two variables to occur at the same time without one causing the other for example there may be a correlation between two events such as you winning and the other person is singing even though winning does not cause singing another example could be that each time you visit a newspaper stand the last newspaper has already been picked up it mean that you picking up the last newspaper it just means that these two events happen together this is known as correlational study 
So another interesting method that is used in psychological research is called observation. Another way to study psychology is by observing what happens. This is called observation. We watch how things happen without getting involved. For example, if you want to study how animals behave in the zoo, you can go to the zoo and watch how a tiger behaves in different situations. It's important to be accurate when you are observing and recording what you see, so that your study is not biased. That is called the psychological method of direct observation for doing a psychological process. And it's a useful way to study the behavior of animals in the zoo and their habitat and other related questions. Now, another interesting way of doing psychological research is called the survey method, where direct observation is difficult. Surveys involve asking people questions either in person or through a questionnaire. This is known as the survey method. It's a way of collecting information indirectly. Surveys are a useful way of doing psychological research when observing directly is not feasible. This method includes interviewing people and asking them questions related to the study. For instance, let's say you want to know if people are satisfied with a certain product. One way to find out is by giving them a survey. A survey is a set of questions about the project and people can answer these questions by ticking on a scale from 1 to 5, where 1 means not happy and 5 means very happy. They can then return the survey to you. And surveys like this are very common. You probably have filled one before, right? So this is an easy and efficient way to gather information and get an idea of how people feel about a certain product. When it's hard to observe people using a certain product or participating in an event, surveys are a great way to gather opinions. Surveys have questions related to the event or product and people fill out the answers and send them back to you. However, surveys have a higher chance of bias, especially from social desirability effect. And what does it mean? It means that people may give answers that they think are socially acceptable rather than their true opinions. Additionally, the experimenter who is collecting and analyzing the survey data may also interpret the data in a way that is biased. So it is important to be aware of these limitations when conducting research using survey method. Another experimental method that is called case histories. Sometimes when we want to study a certain topic, it can be hard to find a large group of people who are experiencing the same thing. That's when we use a special method called case studies. A case study is when we focus on one person at a time and study them in depth. For example, if we want to know how brain damage affects a person's ability to speak, it would be hard to study many people with brain damage. So instead, we would focus on one person, collect information from them and use that information to understand how brain damage affects speech. This is known as case history, where the story of one individual is used as the source of information. It's a very useful method when it's hard to find many people with the same condition to study. And a major drawback of case studies is that they rely on people's memories of past events. This means that if one person is giving information, some of it may be accurate, but some of it may not be entirely true. This is because People's memories can be affected by a variety of factors such as emotions, time that has passed or other experiences. So this can lead to errors and inaccuracies in the data. So it's important to keep in mind that while case studies are a useful method, but they do have limitations and it's important to be aware of them when interpreting the results. Another way of doing psychological research is using literature review. It's a way to study psychology by reviewing past research on a topic. This is called a literature review. There are two main forms of literature reviews. One is narrative review and another one is systematic review. So what is narrative review? So when the author writes about the studies they have been done before and talks about the trends and differences they found, that is what the narrative literature review is. 
the author may be selective in the studies what they choose to include their review and this type of review can be found in research papers or review papers a review paper is that when a researcher looks at all the studies that have been done on a particular topic and discuss the good and bad points of each study this type of literature review is called a narrative review it's important to note that literature reviews are a useful way to understand what research has been done on a topic and to find out what is known and what is still unknown about that topic now systematic review so what is systematic review another way to review past research is by using a method called meta analysis this is a statistical technique where researchers look at all the studies that have been done on a particular topic and analyze the results using statistics they look at how often a particular results was found and how much the results vary from one study to another this helps them to see what previous researchers have found about a particular topic based on this analysis they create a statistical table that summarizes the findings of the previous studies meta analysis is a powerful tool for understanding the findings of past research and can be useful way to look at the overall results of many studies at once it's a systematic and thorough approach which can be more convincing than the other forms of literature review now one important thing in most psychological research is ethical ethics when doing research in psychology it's very important to follow certain guideline to make sure that everyone involved is treated fairly and safely and this is called ethics these guidelines apply to both human and animal research in my lab we do experiments on humans like measuring brain activity or doing brain stimulation using techniques like eeg when we do this kind of research we have to follow specific laws and guidelines to make sure that the people participating in our experiments are safe and their rights are protected so we need to understand the importance of following ethical guidelines in psychological research in order to ensure that the participants are treated with respect and dignity the first ethics that we have to follow in doing human research is something called minimal risk when we conduct research on human subjects it's important that we prioritize their safety and well-being we have to assure that the experiment that we are doing whether it is a brain stimulation experiment or whether it is an eeg experiment or whether it is an mri experiment minimal risks of individual should be taken care of so risk associated with the research should be no greater than those encountered with daily life we cannot stimulate someone with an higher current more than 0.15 ampere if we do that with a higher voltage what will happen is certain regions of the brain will experience certain kind of a discomfort or people will experience discomfort so we have to accept these norms where risk involved with humans should be minimum we cannot reverse the current in an eeg or we cannot use closed chambers or we cannot just boost people into an mri for doing research so the minimum risk has to be followed then informed consent before doing an experiment we have to tell the participant who is being tested what the experiment is all about what we are going to do and what the benefit will be and whether he agrees to participate in the experiment or not it means participants should be informed about the issues that may affect their willingness to participate in the study which will be voluntary participation and they should be able to withdraw at any time without penalty if it is not possible to fully inform the participants they must be debriefed as soon as possible so during debriefing it can be difficult to explain participants what the experiment is all about so after the experiment we debrief and tell them what it is so we employ some deception although a minor deception but this deception should be kept minimum 
first we inform the participant about what is being done in the experiment then what the risk is and whether he is willing to do the experiment based on the risk and the benefit he will receive also we promise him that he can leave the experiment whenever he wants wherever he wants and the data he could not be published now with these freedoms and rights we give him informed consent so if you are using deception for instance if it is a test of attention now if we tell the person to pay attention he will never pay attention so we must use some kind of deceptive method when measuring attention as soon as the experiment is completed we inform the experimenter or the subject about the experiment and provide details including all the scores obtained and this is known as informed consent this is the informed consent where the participant willingly participates in the experiment knowing the risk and benefits with the understanding that he can leave the experiment at any point of the time and if he wishes he can pull out his data at any moment without any restriction after that the right to privacy the right to privacy is another type of ethical concern that we use in most experiments unless participants and the information concerned agree otherwise personal information must be kept private even to this day no matter what experiments we conduct in our laboratory we cannot identify who participated in the experiment because it's a double blind study the person who actually conducts the experiment and the person who recruits people and the person who designs the experiments are all separate people who have no idea who has been recruited and the recruiter has no idea who goes to which group and the person conducting the experiment has no idea who is coming to the lab so there is a complete privacy in However, this type of information cannot be leaked, which is known as privacy maintenance. When conducting research on animals, there are certain ethical guidelines that must be followed. These guidelines are in place to make sure that the animals are not harmed during the experiments. Animals are often used for two main reasons. Firstly, to gain a deeper understanding of animals' behavior. and to study certain aspects of human behavior that cannot be studied using other methods it is important to remember that when we do experiments with animals we have to follow these ethical guidelines to ensure the welfare of the animals and make sure that the research is done responsibly when scientists want to create a new drug for humans they often begin by testing it on animals like rats This help them understand how the drug might affect behavior and if there are any negative side effects or not. For example, if the drug is meant to change how people feel about a certain things, scientists might test it on rats to see if it changes their behavior in certain ways. By doing test on animals first, scientists can make sure that the drug is safe to use in humans and it will work the way it's supposed to this is important for making sure that people who take the drug will be safe and that it will help them secondly to gain models for human system when we do it on animals we learn about how this behavior develops and how the brain responds to it then we can apply this behavior or experiment on humans which may be impossible or unethical to achieve on humans so if an experiment is unethical to perform on humans we first test it on an animal model and if it is successful we proceed to the human model we perform any type of surgery electrical shock therapy or drug testing on animal models and lower animal models first then test the drug on humans based on this animal models so when conducting animal research it is important to keep ethical principles in mind especially when the procedures may cause harm or pain this is particularly important in the development of cancer treatment drugs where rats are frequently used as models in these cases 
the rats are first induced with cancer and then given the new drug to see how effective it is. If the treatment fails, the rat is killed or injured and certain areas of the brain are studied to better understand cellular physiology. To ensure that these procedures are ethical and necessary, it is critical to justify them through thorough knowledge gained. When conducting research on animals, it is important to ensure that the animals are treated humanly and with minimal suffering. This includes providing them with necessary food and water in a painless manner and avoiding causing discomfort. Additionally, if the animal is to be killed, it should be done in a way that causes minimal suffering and not through torture. Overall, the ethical treatment of animal is crucial in animal research. This is what we have learned in this lesson about introducing psychology. So this brings us to the end of this section or this lecture on introducing psychology. So let's do a quick recap. So what we did today, we looked at different perspectives of psychology and starting with the biological perspective, then behavioral perspective, cognitive perspective, and then psychoanalytic perspective, and lastly, the subjective perspective. So we looked at all of these perspectives and these perspectives are actually ways of looking at any psychological behavior. And we analyzed all of these perspectives and defined behavior based on them. Then we looked at how the biological and psychological perspectives are related to one another. And following that, we looked at some newer perspectives such as cognitive neuroscience, idea of newer sciences that have entered psychology and how these newer sciences are actually explaining psychology. In addition to that, we looked at how psychology research is conducted and experimentation methods. We investigated the method of observation, then we investigated the survey method, we investigated correlational method as well as the case history method and the method of conducting a We examined and compared various methods of conducting psychological research. Towards the end of the lecture, we focused on the various ethical principles that must be followed while doing psychological research and we outlined the ethical methods that must be followed for humans and the ethical methods that must be followed for animals. And then we listed a number of methods and these methods or these principles must be strictly followed when you actually doing psychological research. Overall, the first and second lecture sum up or cover what psychology is, how it is to be done, what the various branches of psychology are, and so on and so forth. So from the next lecture onwards, we will look at psychological phenomena or sensation, perception, memory, learning, and other topics and then break them down to teach you what they are. Studying this will teach you how to interpret human behavior, which is the goal of this human behavior course.